the sun is it's it's turning just like darkness in the middle of the day. Are you serious? This is a sign from God, no doubt. Pastor Joe Fox. I'm the pastor here of Shofar Mountain. What do I do? Uh, everything. Try to build community. Try to pastor a flock. I call myself a neo-pioneer. So right now we're at Shofar Mountain. Uh, we're nestled in the Ozarks. It is a community of like-minded people who believe, like I do, we started out as an intentional community where everyone lived here on this piece of land and that has morphed into everyone has their own land, their own place, their own home and yet still we're all very close to each other. You know, within a half a mile we have several houses of saints and we get together regularly to play, to fellowship, to work. When somebody has a project that they need an extra hand on, it's just a phone call and a short walk or a very, very fast drive uh, to get to their house and help them out and we're all here. This was originally built by the uh, U.S. Army back in uh, 1941 for storage of weapons, munitions. You know, we learned about this and we jumped on it. We launched last October of 2016 and this is the big kickoff this weekend. My name is Robert Vecino, the founder and CEO of the Vivos Group. Vivos is a network of nuclear blast-proof shelters designed and built to withstand Armageddon and everything that we could have possibly imagined would come along with it. It's a series of shelters for thousands of people to survive whatever that may be. Yeah, preppers. They used to be called survivalists, and then survivalists got a bad name. Old Vietnam vets that were maladjusted living in the woods, and so that kind of went away until, what, about 10 years ago, a prepper term came out. And prepper's like a softer version of a survivalist. It's a more politically correct term. A prepper is somebody who prepares for unforeseen eventualities. And so they try to take steps to ensure that they and theirs are taken care of in troubling times. But more important than surviving, it's to come out the other side. And so while the rest of the world not only has to survive the event itself, they have to also survive the aftermath. There won't be a supermarket, there won't be an internet, there won't be fuel, there won't be communication, transportation, anything. Either you've got your supplies and you've prepared, or you haven't. I can tell you that 99 plus percent of the world's population will not be prepared. Hard times are coming. Tribulation is coming. Nukes are gonna fly. It's just, it's a fact of life. And the fact that it's so horrible uh, makes people not want to consider it and they want to stick their you know, hands over their eyes and over their ears and say, no, 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 I don't hear you because they cannot contemplate living in a situation where a nuclear war has occurred. What if you were one of the survivors that now has to forage and survive on the surface with no preparations, maybe no weapons? It's a very real threat and I submit it's gonna happen. You can read it in the word. Is the fear of the apocalypse alive today? 
yes, I think people are genuinely concerned about it. Yes, in the modern era, people are trying to still perceive and get a sense of the end of days. When is it going to happen? What's going to happen to me and to mine during this period? Our news is accelerating our awareness of something seems to be in the air to give. They did a search, right, post-election. What are the top questions per state? And in Indiana, one of the questions that came up, one of the top search questions was, is Trump the Antichrist? 41% of Americans believe we are living in the last days. That's Christian and non-Christian. And so many people look around their world, they see instability, they see unrest, they see uncertainty. Things are melting down. Just look around. North Korea to the Middle East to Russia to a possible world war. You know, the left versus the right. It's going crazy right now. I think everybody pretty much understands that the apocalypse is the end, it's chaos, it's oh my goodness, the earth is going crazy and people be dying. Well, the term apocalypse comes from the Greek apocalypsis, which means a revelation. But the term also gets loosely used anytime you're talking about any kind of disaster. Every other sci-fi story, every other event that people talk about, different scenarios for the end of the world as we know it, it's all based on little subset stories that comes out of the original story described in the apocalypse of the book of Revelation. Well, the book of Revelation was written by John in 96 AD, one of the apostles, an eyewitness to Christ. And he had a massive vision of Jesus returning and the end of time. It is a picture of the end, end of the age, the end of time, the end of life here on earth as we know it. It's just a time of strife and disease and sickness and famine and just, oh my. This is a scary message. In fact, I know a lot of churches, they won't even allow the book of Revelation to be taught. It's a great cosmological drama where the forces of evil are going to marshal against the forces of good. And in this great last battle, all the, the scores are going to be reckoned, right? You're going to see the persecutors get their comeuppance. It's why a lot of apocalyptic texts in a lot of ways um, evoke a bit of a vengeance narrative. And this culminates in the rise of a one world government, a one world power led by a guy, the Antichrist, who's in charge of everybody and he's evil. He's evil personified. And then there's a final battle, Armageddon, uh, that will take place in the Middle East, you know, where Israel is today. We win and Jesus comes down and establishes his kingdom here on earth for a thousand years of a reign. And so that's the start of the new beginning. And then after that, it very simply says, and then there was a new heaven and a new earth. And we don't really see that part yet. What are the signs of the end of the age? They asked Jesus on top of Mount of Olives, not far from where we are right now. He basically says, there is going to be a great time of trouble and tribulation. But he says, before that, you have to understand, there are several signs. Rumors of wars and wars, nation against nation, people against people, earthquakes, pestilences. And he spoke of all of that. And then, of course, he said, that is just the beginning. I've been studying prophecy for the last 30 years. I'm watching more now happen than I've ever seen before. We are watching nations rise against nations. We are watching the increase in earthquakes. We are watching volcanic activity. We are watching the earthworm. Oh, so prophecy is some kind of prediction. Nothing wrong with that in the sense that, you know, scientists make predictions. But of course, we make a distinction between scientific predictions, which we don't call prophecy, and religious or spiritual prophecies loaded with mythological, purposeful, meaningful type consequences of how it's going to affect our lives, your life, my life, what it all means for humanity, society, the world. 
Jesus' disciples approached him and they asked him a question. They said, Lord, what will be the sign of the end of the age and of your coming again? And one of the very first things that Jesus said to them was, is that life will be like it was in the days of Noah when the end times come. In the days of Noah, there was pandemic godlessness, there was unrestrained immorality, there was worldwide violence taking place. And scripture tells us there was a worldwide flood where God destroyed billions of people and only eight people were saved out of that flood. And the book of Revelation outlines the fact that God will unleash his wrath once again. That's a very unpleasant thought, but at the same time, you have to see it from God's perspective that he's only giving people what they deserve. For a lot of people, they see the apocalypse, they dread it, but there are also those who hope for it and who hope for it fervently, who want their persecutors or who want people that they see as deserving of vengeance to get it. If your enemy is, in, is among the unrighteous, you're going to take pleasure in seeing them get their comeuppance. You're going to take pleasure in seeing them suffer the same traumas you will, but you will be redeemed at the end and they won't. Believers, Christians, Torah observant, or otherwise, uh, look at the apocalypse as, Woohoo! We got over on those other guys. I, I think if we're doing it right, we're praying for those other guys to come to the, to the truth and to understand what's going on. None of us are getting out of here alive, if you will. No, we had to go in and we had to do what was right and a lot of people died. A half million Americans died because that's our responsibility to take care of that. When the watchman on the wall sees trouble coming, and if he doesn't sound the alarm, the blood of everyone is on his head. That is the responsibility that I feel. That's why I have to do what I do. But one day, Yeshua is coming back, but there's a lot of things that are going to happen first, and that is what has to get out to the world because the brimstone is about to hit the fan. My name is Michael Rood. I have been producing A Rood Awakening from Israel, a television teaching series for the past 20 years. When I read the Bible, I see a movie play out. I see the order of events play out. And when I don't understand the order of events, the film stops until I get it figured out. Sometimes I've had questions that have taken 20, 30 years to answer. The book of the Revelation entails so much of the prophets that have spoken in antiquity. And to understand all of these things in order, in sequence, this has been my driving motivation. People think the apocalypse is the end of the world. It is not. It's the beginning of the messianic age. It's a, it's a change in the course of human events where the Almighty enters into the course of human events and acts like has not been seen since the crossing of the Red Sea, if you please. The things that the prophets said will come to pass in the last days, that must come to pass in the last days, are coming to pass right now. <sighs> All of my life, I've heard the mantra that Jesus could return at any moment. It's not true. There are legal prerequisites to the return of the Messiah if the word of God is true. If what Yeshua said is true, if what the prophets have spoken is true, there are things that are coming down in the world right now that's going to turn everything completely upside down. There are wars spoken of against the land of Israel that will destroy entire buildings, including the wood stone, and leave behind a deadly residue. When Israel cries out as a nation, Almighty God intervenes, and even though that war in the aftermath has turned the sun dark, has turned the stars dark, and turned the moon into blood, he is going to fight for his people, and they will survive. This is what is coming in the future, and it looks like the very near future. This fall, we are coming up on a very significant point in time. The armies are 
getting ready to make their move, Bible prophecy is being fulfilled today in the land of Israel. And we are in the middle of this thing right now. As Yeshua destroys those who attempt to annihilate Israel and nullify the everlasting covenant God made with his people. Yes, all of the land from the Euphrates to the Nile belongs to the sons of Israel. Every nation that stands against that covenant will find itself on the battlefield against the Almighty. I'm Michael Rood, bidding you shalom, peace. And I will see you on the sea of fire and glass when the smoke clears. Everyone who studies end times kind of theology, they focus on Israel. Why Israel? Right now it's a little country in the Middle East that has not a whole lot going for it in the terms of great powers or things like that, if you just want to look at it from a worldly perspective. If you were an anthropologist from Mars and you came here to study the earthlings and what they're like, I mean, Israel would be like one of the last things you'd investigate in terms of economic power, political importance, even, you know, the number of Jews, 13, 14 million worldwide, it's nothing. Where it becomes important is the meme of the sacredness of the land. And there, an anthropologist from Mars would go, Oh, I see. So this is mythology. This is religion. This has nothing to do with reality. That part of the world is the part of the world that God has chosen for his people. The nation Israel is the only nation on planet Earth that God ever made a covenant with. In fact, he made a covenant with their founder, their ancestor, Abraham. And the Bible says that God would give the Jews a certain land that they would occupy forever. He also said that, David, that someone would sit upon David's throne, that being the Messiah. And so the reason Israel is so important, according to the Bible, is that God has made promises to Israel, some of which he has fulfilled in the past, and some of which he has yet fulfilled, i.e. those promises about the land. And so if you want to know what God's going to do in the future, you have to follow Israel. Israel has a lot of prophecy in the Old Testament that talks about what's going to happen in the last days. Just the regathering of it, that is one of the uh, things that Jesus mentioned in Matthew chapter 24. He said that the fig tree will blossom. The fig tree is a symbol of Israel. How interesting that a people who have been scattered for 20 centuries all over the world have come back together exactly as the Bible prophesied that they would. If you were to pick one sign to say this is the sign of the end times, the regathering of Israel becoming a nation again, and Jews all over the world returning to their homeland, that really is the sign of the end times. The 1948 formation of the state of Israel was the starting of the clock. This is it, the tribulation's gonna come, the unfolding of the signs. Admittedly, that's a big one. Previous generations didn't have that. They didn't have Israel as a state. In Ezekiel chapters 36, 37, 38, and 39 is giving a chronological, beautiful display of the preparation of the land of Israel prior to the return of the Jews. The return of the Jews from the ashes of the Holocaust back to their land. And then once Israel is safe, secure, prosperous, then we're going to have a major attack coming. Psalms 102, 
when God will build up Zion, that's when he will appear in his glory. In 1967, Jerusalem, which is known as Zion in the Bible, was back in Israel's hands. Well, today, concerning the geopolitical state of Israel, all the uproar is about the building up of the settlements in Jerusalem. Everyone's complaining that Jerusalem continues to be built up by the Jewish people, taking over what they consider to be Palestinian territory. But in Psalms 102, the next verse says that this is written for the generation to come. But in Hebrew, it means the terminal generation, the last generation. So that is telling us the generation that sees Jerusalem is the terminal generation that will see the coming of the Messiah. Okay, so what? You know, to say, well, I predict Israel will be attacked or there'll be trouble in, in the Middle East involving Israel. Well, no kidding. I mean, has there been a day, you know, since 1948 where there hasn't been some kind of tension? A big war is right on the very verge right now. And when this thing goes down, you're going to see Israel coming back from the nations of the world into this parcel of land that goes halfway into Iraq, all the way into Egypt. It all belongs to the sons of Israel. It's an eternal promise, and an eternal promise made by Almighty God will come to pass. The first time that someone steps foot in the city of Jerusalem, you feel like you're home. It is such a foreign, environment to anyone that comes from the West, but there's something about it that just feels like this is where I belong. Now the world is upside down here. We've got the Muslim quarter, the Christian quarter. We've got the Jewish quarter. We've got the Armenian quarter. People from different parts of the world have come here and they've settled. They disagree on religion and a thousand things, but yet this still is a city in which you feel a peace. As we are walking down here, little children, two and three year old children, playing in the streets of Jerusalem, just a couple blocks from the Muslim quarter, Jewish children playing in the street. It's not like what people imagine they see on television. People are living, it's real life here, and people are trying to find out how to live together, how there can be peace. And unfortunately, there are those who want to completely destroy Israel, that say they don't have a right to be here. This is their land. It has always been their land. So Jerusalem is the holiest of sites. It's the omphalos, or the navel of the world because it's where, in the Christian conception, it's where Jesus and the disciples worked, right? Where they walked, where they ministered. So the end of the book of the Revelation shows the vision of the heavenly Jerusalem. And this is supposed to be the, the focal point for this new world, in a lot of ways, this new society, where all the suffering and all the death and all the tears of the old order are wiped away. So Jerusalem plays an important role both physically, but also symbolically. Jerusalem is ground zero for the apocalypse. All of the end time prophecies center on this very city. And it looks like everything is getting ready to go into play for the fall of 2017, which is the Jubilee year, according to the ancient calendar. A Jubilee year occurs every 50 years within a certain time frame on the biblical calendar. Seven years, seven times to get to what is known as the year of Jubilee. And the year of Jubilee, biblically, is when all debts were canceled and all the land returned back to the original owner. Uh, many people believe that God will return in a year of Jubilee because in Leviticus 25, God says, all the earth is mine, the land will not be sold forever. And so many believe that it will be some year in a Jubilee cycle that God will return and reclaim the earth. I live in a Jewish community in the Galilee and I was given a manuscript concerning the prophecy 
of a 13th century Jewish sage, a rabbi, Judah the Righteous. He said that for 400 years, eight jubilees, the Ottoman Turks would rule Jerusalem. Then it would be no man's land for one jubilee. And then the next jubilee, it would be in the hands of the Jewish nation. And then the next jubilee would be the beginning of the end time messianic age. In 1217, Judah the Righteous spoke these words. 300 years, six jubilee periods later, in 1517, the Ottoman Turks took Jerusalem. They held it for 400 years, exactly eight jubilees to 1917. That is when General Allenby took Jerusalem. It immediately, under the guidance and the directive of the League of Nations, the predecessor to the United Nations, was labeled no man's land. Exactly the words of Judah the Righteous hundreds and hundreds of years earlier. And for one jubilee, it was no man lands, and then the Jewish nation, which had not been for nearly 2,000 years, took Jerusalem and has now held it in 2017, according to Judah the Righteous, begins the end time messianic age. This is the 50th year or jubilee anniversary for Jerusalem, but also we have the 70th anniversary of Israel becoming a nation. These are right on top of each other. Could something happen prophetically this year? When we come to the end of September, that is when we are expecting the full-scale invasion in the war against Israel. According to the prophets, and the prophet Zechariah specifically, he told us exactly what he saw by revelation. He saw cylindrical shaped objects, flying objects that have an evil fire offering encased in lead sent from the land of Shinar, which is modern day Iran, Iraq, Syria, against the land of Israel. And these flying containers that he saw 2,400 years ago are the exact dimensions of a modern day Scud missile. And this thing is all ramping up for this full scale war. Yeshua told John to write down the things that he's just seen, the things which are now, and the things that will come to pass in the future. He sees Yeshua rip off seven seals from the scroll, and the events that play out on the earth are cataclysmic. We see death happen. We see a great sword. We see biological warfare, famine, and pestilence, disease. We see the sky roll back and clouds roll up that darken out the sun, moon, and stars. Very clearly what we would think of as thermal nuclear war. You read about cities being destroyed you know, in a blink of an eye, in an instant, in an hour, uh, destruction comes. You read about the fire, you read about men's skin melting off their bones and things like that. I mean, for somebody who had no concept of really of explosives and fire like we make fire now in the modern times. I think if you just look at it with a clear mind and say, what was John really talking about when he tried to describe these visions that he had? It's obviously, to me, it's obviously nuclear war. If we're focused on Israel in the spotlight, yeah, there's going to be nuclear war there. People who study the Middle East, they say the whole thing is like a big powder keg. There's fuses all over the place. We're just waiting for one of them to get lit. Since Israel became a nation, they have fought many wars and they're always on guard against another war. And if you track any of that news, well, it looks like it could happen any moment. It's that volatile. Iran has said openly, the leader, that when they get a nuke, they are going to nuke Israel. The one nation that the prophets say is going to nuke Israel in the last days. Qatar has one nuclear warhead that we know of. They, they have one, but they are in the hands of the radicals that want to nuke Israel. We could see this thing turn around very quickly. And as we see in the book of the Revelation that this great sword is given, a great sword, and this great sword is going to take peace from the earth and is going to cause people to kill each other. This is the most exciting time that has ever been in the history of mankind. 
And when these wars start happening and the nukes start flying, it's like, okay, hold on. This is going to be one wild ride. And I want to be here in this city when this whole thing comes down. I want to be here when the smoke clears. Michael Rood is one who is saying that uh, there will definitely be a war in Israel and a nuclear war. Where does that come from? Is that a prophecy? Is that something directly given from God? Is that something that he knows for a surety? Or is it something he's uh, postulating as something that's a, that could possibly happen? Uh, I would be very, very interested to find out why he feels that that would happen if he has some spiritual insight to it. I'm very cautious. I have been hearing these predictions since the early 1970s. None of it has happened. There's nothing really happening in terms of the end of the world as predicted by the Bible or, or any other source. So really it then becomes an interesting study in the psychology of belief. So I was not raised religious, but I became a, a pretty hardcore born-again evangelical Christian. I went to Pepperdine University, which is a Church of Christ school, very evangelical. We definitely believed in the end times, the apocalypse, the whole thing. I mean, I read uh, Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth. Oh my gosh, in the early 70s, this was the best-selling book in America. Everybody was reading the daily newspaper with the book. You know, you got the book open here, you got the newspaper open here, and go, oh, look, it said the seven-headed beast, and, you know, who is the, the Antichrist? Maybe it's Henry Kissinger. And I remember thinking, wow, this is so incredible that I am living through this special time. How, how lucky for me. And I'm on the special team that gets to be raptured off and, and so forth because I had accepted Jesus as my Savior. So I had a professor in college who I was feeding this information to. And he pointed out that we're actually just looking for and finding things to fit. You could go back into time in any period of history and go, oh look, there was wars, there was revolutions, there were riots, there were earthquakes, there were famine. You know, pretty much any kind of thing that someone like a Hal Lindsey would find matching biblical prophecy would fit any generation, no matter how far back you want to go. I didn't believe it at first. I thought, no, no, he's wrong and, and I'm right and all this stuff is real. But then it kind of sat back there in the back of my mind, like, what are the chances that of all these people for thousands of years that have been predicting the end of the world and that they are the chosen generation, they're the special one, what are the chances that I'm that actual generation? Come on. And that's pretty much when I jumped off the bandwagon. In 1954, there was a woman in the Chicago area, early follower of L. Ron Hubbard and Dianetics. She kind of heard voices of the aliens were coming and that on December 21st, 1954, there would be a massive rupture in the Earth's crust. There'd be huge floods. The United States would be wiped out. And a young psychologist named Leon Fessinger thought, well, well this will be interesting because she actually put a date on it. I'm going to go there and join them and see what happens when prophecy fails. So he did. So they went to the mountaintop, whatever, the local hill there. And, and these are followers who had, you know, like sold their belongings, you know, given up their stuff and like, okay, here we go. And, you know, December 21st, midnight, they're up there, you know, and they're looking and, you know, Fessinger is there with his clipboard going, okay, what's going to happen? And, you know, it's like midnight, 12.05, and, you know, people are looking around like, well, what time have you got? Uh, you know, oh, and then it's like 12.30, 1 o'clock. Well, maybe it was West Coast time, you know, and, well, maybe my clock's off and maybe we miscalculated. And anyway, so what Fessinger uh, did was he wrote a famous book called When Prophecy Fails. And what he discovered was that not only did no one say, well, this was an idiotic idea, can I have my stuff back? No, no, they doubled down on their belief. They put even more effort into recruiting new members to their particular uh, belief that next year it's going to come. We miscalculated. And so he called this cognitive dissonance. That is, what happens when you have two things collide, your belief and reality, and they don't match? So I think this is going to happen, nothing happens. What do you do? You rationalize the belief, you rationalize the facts to fit the belief. You know, here's a map, here's the other map. Let's see if we can make a match. It's a feature, not a bug of human cognition. It's just what we do to support our most cherished beliefs. There's a sea of random noise of just stuff always going on. Just, just tune on the daily news, 
Somewhere there's a war, somewhere there's a revolution, somewhere there's a riot, somewhere there's an earthquake. People are killed and it's terrible. Every day. The moment you say, okay, now I'm interested in this subject and I'm going to start paying attention and see if I can find a match of this pattern with that pattern, you will. But that doesn't mean it's real because the pattern is actually there, not out there. There's nothing wrong with us looking at these things and saying, here are these patterns. This looks like this pattern is now all stacking up. 1917, General Allenby takes Jerusalem. 1967, 50 years later, one Jubilee. The nation of Israel, which didn't exist in 1917, took Jerusalem. 2017 being the next Jubilee. Well, that Jubilee also happens to be 70 years from when Israel became a nation in one day, fulfilling the 2,600-year-old prophecy of Isaiah. When we see all these patterns in place, we have to say that this may be the hand of the Almighty. It could be coincidence, but I think we'd be foolish to just brush it all aside as just coincidence. We need to open our eyes and see if the Almighty is not telling us something. What's a sign? You know, they take many forms, but certainly signs in the sky have always been signs from the Father. And there are some amazing things going on in the sky. It's not surprising that people would pay attention to the sky. It is, in fact, half of the environment. One of the things that people notice, besides the incredible grandeur and beauty of something like the night sky, or the majesty and the predictability of the phases of the moon and the sunrises and the sunsets, is the fact that the sky is a convenient source of order. We have seasons on the planet that are just a product of the Earth moving in its orbit around the sun. But here on the Earth, in antiquity, people saw the sun seeming to move through the sky. They saw the moon move fast through the sky and change phases over the course of a month. They saw the stars come and go in different seasons. And those were all keys to survival because those seasonal changes signaled the need or change for food, shelter, clothing, resources. And so just about everybody depended on the sky one way or another. The tradition of using the stars and the constellations and so forth in the ancient Hebrew culture started in Genesis chapter 1, and it says that God himself placed stars and signs in the heavens and the atmosphere. The Jewish people later formed their calendar on astronomical observations and the sighting of the new moon every month from Jerusalem. But, very interestingly, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament, calls a series of feasts in the book of Leviticus, a moed, M-O-E-D, and these are appointed times that God deals with people on the earth or the Jewish people themselves. In Leviticus 23, the Father tells Moses to tell the Israelites that he's got a calendar and he's got appointments on them, and he sums them up. There are seven appointments. There's Passover, there's unleavened bread, there's first fruits, there's Pentecost, there's the Feast of Trumpets, there's the Feast of Atonement, and there's the Feast of Tabernacles. All of Israel's feast days have to do with the phases of the moon. Some of the feasts will be started on the new moon. So the moon is extremely important in the feast days. As a matter of fact, Passover has to have a full moon. The feast days are highly related to apocalyptic events, to the book of Revelation. We cannot understand the book of Revelation or the apocalypse without understanding the feast days. The book of the Revelation is the Messiah fulfilling the fall feast of the Lord. All those things that we were to rehearse that the scriptures speak of uh, from Yom Trua, the day of trumpets, day of shouting, uh, through Yom Kippur and the feast of Sukkot or the feast of tabernacles, it is all there embedded in there and it's all in the book of the Revelation. The Creator runs the universe according to His time clock, whether we recognize it, live by it, understand it or not, makes no difference to Him. The next feast that needs to be fulfilled is the Feast of Trumpets, and then after that, the Feast of Atonement, and then after that, the Feast of Tabernacles.
An eclipse is when one body goes in the shadow of another or one body blocks out all or part of another. So an eclipse of the sun is when the moon goes between us and the sun. An eclipse of the moon is when the moon goes into the shadow of the earth. And these things happen uh, five or six times a year. They're very ordinary. God said he created the sun and the moon for signs. What greater sign could that have meant but solar and lunar eclipses? While eclipses are natural phenomena, what gives them prophetic significance is when they happen on the biblical calendar and when we look scientifically at the patterns of when they have occurred historically. And back in 2014 and 2015, I originally discovered that there were these four total lunar eclipses falling on the biblical holy days, two years in a row, back to back. So I did research to find out when was the last time this happened. And I noticed the last time it happened was 1967 when Israel recaptured Jerusalem. Hello, these are very prophetically significant. And then the time before that was right after they became a nation in 1948. And then the time before that was 1492 when all the Jews were kicked out of Spain because of the Spanish Inquisition. So all I did was connect the dots between NASA, when eclipses occur, with the biblical calendar, and then it comes to, okay, what is the prophetic meaning? The blood red moon is not uncommon in itself, but they are uncommon when they fall on feast days exactly, especially in tetrads, having four of them within a span of a year or two. I think the celestial events are kind of like parables. Jesus taught parables and he hid truths in those parables. I think that's the exact same thing with celestial events. Just as if you're driving down the road and you see a sign that says the bridge is out, it better not be where the bridge is out. It better be a mile ahead to give you warning. So for me, these signs in the heavens were warning us about what is coming over the next several years. The Great American Eclipse is something that is fairly rare. We are going to see a total solar eclipse in August of 2017 come across America from the state of Washington to the state of Georgia. The total eclipse is going to be amazing. It's going to be the first time in decades that we've had a total eclipse that's visible over most of the continental United States. Total eclipses happen fairly regularly on the Earth. I mean, every other year approximately there's going to be a total eclipse somewhere on the earth but you know most of the earth is water a lot of the earth is not very well populated this is the first event in most people's lifetimes where it's visible to millions of people almost anyone in the united states could drive and within a day be on the path of totality so this is a big deal every culture for thousands of years have looked at eclipses as a warning from God or from the heavens. Well, what you have to do is look at the pattern. In 763 BC, Jonah was sent to Nineveh. Jonah was an Old Testament prophet who was commissioned by God to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is today currently Mosul. It was a very ungodly area, it was pagan, and he was told to go and bring him to repentance. And Nona balked at that, and didn't want to go, and rebelled, and went the opposite way. After he is swallowed by what the Bible says is a great fish, he is vomited back up on the beach, and he now goes to Nineveh. And when he finally goes there, the entire city repents, the Bible says, in sackcloth and ashes, including the king. There was a big plague that affected the entire city of Nineveh. As a matter of fact, the king couldn't even go out to war in the spring as kings normally do. This was followed by a civil war, which was followed by another plague. And then in that summer, you have this total solar eclipse that goes over Nineveh. So all the Ninevites, they are scared to death having had a plague, a civil war, another plague, and now this total solar eclipse. Nineveh is recorded to have had the Bursagel eclipse of 763 BC. 
the thing that may have made Nineveh repent uh, could have been that total solar eclipse. Jonah arrives on the biblical calendar the first day of Elul. Now that is going to be around September 1st. And in the Bible, that month is known as the month of repentance. Now what many people don't realize, this warning was a 40-day warning. Well, that leads you to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which is also the Day of Judgment when God judges the nations. And so here we have on August 21st of 2017, a total solar eclipse that just so happens to occur on the first of Elul, the very beginning of the month of repentance that is leading up to the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. This has to be more than coincidence. The sun, as far as a total solar eclipse, refers to judgment coming upon the nations. When was the last time we had a total solar eclipse that completely crossed the United States? Did you know it was at the end of World War I? And here we have America involved in World War I. Many people don't realize World War I also began with a total solar eclipse that went all through Eastern Europe, through Turkey, and even went all the way through Nineveh. And what do we see happened? The Ottoman Empire is destroyed, and the solar eclipse went right through the Ottoman Empire. So we see a pattern of judgment. Interestingly enough, Jesus said that a generation towards the end, when asking about the end of time, Jesus said they would be given the sign of Jonah. Maybe it's talking about an eclipse. And if that's the case, then America needs to take warning. There are some people who just don't listen to reason. Eclipses repeat more or less on the surface of the Earth as the Earth rotates and the Moon goes around the Earth every 18 years, 11 and a third days. A third of a day um, gives the Earth a third of a turn. Uh, so the, each eclipse is in that series, which is called the Saros, is a little further north, a little further south than the last one. and. By the time you're through with three or four hundred years, the Earth's surface is covered with the paths of eclipses. We just happen to be in the middle of this one, which is fun for us, but there's nothing really special about it except that we happen to live here. You know, people in history have been afraid of eclipses and thought they sort of, yeah, were foreboding uh, signs of, of things to, to come. And that's where science is helping us. I mean, we're not afraid of eclipses anymore, at least most people aren't. We understand what they are. Um, it's just a simple geometrical alignment. I think one of the things that's happening with the great American eclipse is that there's something following it. On September 23rd of 2017, there is an alignment that is happening in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the constellations, which looks like something that John wrote about in chapter 12 of the book of Revelation. In the first two verses, he's talking about the sun, the moon, the stars, the wandering stars, which we call planets, and a constellation, which is Virgo. John says that he sees a great sign in heaven that there is a woman, she is clothed in the sun with the moon under her feet, and she has a crown of 12 stars on her head. But she's also pregnant, but not just pregnant, she's in labor and about to give birth. We know that Virgo would be the woman. The moon will actually be at her feet. Uh, the sun will traverse right by her shoulder, clothing her in the sun. And in her head will be 12 stars. Nine of those will be the constellation of Leo. It makes up Leo, they're always there. But the three other ones that are not there are the syzygy, the alignment of planets. Mercury will align, we'll have Venus that's there, and also Mars, making up the 12 stars. And we can see that the 12 constellations around the ecliptic only has one woman in it that the sun, the moon, and the wandering stars can travel through. And that would be Virgo. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars, she was pregnant. Now, how can a sign in heaven be pregnant?
there's another planet that is right now being in what we would call the womb of Virgo for several months and it will exit that womb due to what's called retrograde motion which is going back and forth on September 23rd. What happened in November of 2016, the planet Jupiter moves into the birthing canal in the constellation of this woman and it stays there for a period of close to 42 weeks which is a human gestation period and it doesn't exit until the sign is finished on September 23rd, 2017. If Virgo is pregnant with Jupiter and it's nine months to deliver, exactly nine months, then the question is, what happened exactly nine months before September 23rd? So the UN Resolution 2334 passed in December of 2016, censuring Israel for having any type of developments, any type of settlements in the 1967 borders. And that has caused a major firestorm. Those settlements are in those areas that are contested by the Palestinians. That censuring has really given the world a stance against Israel. The UN seems to have resolution after resolution against Israel, the tiny nation that's only the size of Connecticut. And I think you're seeing an anti-Semitism. One of the things that I've noticed is that every time you see anti-Semitism grow in the world, whether it's 1917 or whether it's 1939, you usually see a world war. When we see this occurrence of Jupiter going into the womb of, of Virgo, that does happen every 11 years. It's not rare. We know the moon's at her feet once a year, so that's not rare. Uh, what we do see is very rare are these three planets lining up in Leo. As they come in again, this makes this occurrence once every 7,000 years. That is extremely rare. I actually took the time, I went back 6,000 years, and I took screenshots of every single time that the woman was clothed in the sun with the moon at her feet. Because again, that happens every year. But do you have her giving birth? And do you have 12 stars at her head? There's never been a day that the exact same thing that happens in 2017 has ever happened. I also went 1,000 years into the future. It's just not there. This is the year that it seems that John saw. Right down the line, every single thing that's going to happen on September 23rd factually is mentioned in a book that's 2,000 years old. This is what Revelation 12 is talking about. And so it's a time marker. This is starting to happen now. And I think if the people are right about this, and I find the evidence rather compelling uh, that they are, I believe we can expect to see some significant activity on or around September 23rd. It's like I tell people, your world can change very quickly. A shock and awe for real. It's very interesting that this Revelation 12 sign, it aligns at the time of the Feast of Trumpets. The alignment will be obscured because the sun will be there. It's happening in the daytime. How is this sign going to be seen? How is it going to be observed? It can be observed by astronomical programs, but it's going to be observed very likely by people. Is there any scenario that can allow us to see this alignment in the middle of the day? There are a couple things that have been postulated. One of them was some type of dust that would come from a volcano that still would obscure that sky so you wouldn't see it. It would darken the sky, but it would obscure it. The other one is that some type of cosmic occurrence could come and cause the sun to be darkened. We know it can't be an eclipse because the moon's on, the, on her feet, so we know that. So it would have to be another, another body, another object coming and obscuring the sun. And that would have to enter outside of our solar system. The only way this can happen is the last part of Revelation 12, 1 through 5, starting in Revelation 12, Verse 3, you have the appearance of the red dragon. In Revelation chapter 12, it also talks about a great red dragon. It talks about that dragon ready to consume that child once it's delivered. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, 
one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was cut up to God into his throne. On September 23rd, 2017, this very highly unusual once in an era alignment can be seen in visible light by the naked eye if planet X eclipses the sun during that morning. In Revelation 12, 1, 2, there's an object called the Red Dragon. And this Red Dragon is the Planet X system. I've seen pictures of it before they were blacked out on the sky view. It's a picture that looks like two eyes or two objects, two planets, with a series of smaller satellites around it. It's a very frightening picture. Planet X is a planetary body that has crossed Earth's inner solar system before and caused great havoc in the past and is coming back soon again and sometime in the near future. People have known about it for years. It's been in popular science magazines as far back as the uh, 1950 stories about Planet X. The real hunt for Planet X was the launch of the space probes in the 1970s and the launch of the IRIS satellite in 1983. This is an infrared satellite that was doing sky mapping in the infrared range in 1983. And this absolutely located it and gave definition to it. It was major news on the front cover of US News and World Report. It was in the New York Times, the Washington Post. It was a big story, but nobody paid much attention to it. It has a straight elliptical orbit and it's come through and it crosses Earth path twice. That gives us three fixed points the center of the sun where it pivots from, and two crossings on Earth path, which is roughly five months apart. It's not going to collide with the Earth, but parts of its asteroid belt and so forth will collide with the Earth. Well, a third of the stars thrown down by the dragon's tail is an asteroid debris field behind this object. It can affect electromagnetically anything it approaches. And a lot of people are saying, why do we have global warming? And they blame it on all kinds of things, hairsprays, fuel emissions. Is Planet X the cause of our climate change? I would say yes, without a doubt. It's affecting our sun. Sun is tilted by extra six degrees. Earth is tilted extra four degrees. Our magnetic north is moving at 12 times its normal rate. We have some anomalies that car Mr. exhaust fumes cannot explain. That doesn't change the magnetic north of Earth. Only another magnetic field can. And that would be another planet. This is a huge system and it will be passing 10, 12 million miles close to the Earth. It will block the sun and it will light up the nighttime sky in this once in a era dramatic set of circumstances will be visible for the Earth's people will be visible for the Earth's TV cameras, and it will be a fulfillment of the last great sign in the Book of the Apocalypse. Remember, in ancient times, they didn't have the word planet or comet or any of these modern terms. The most common term in, throughout Asia is fiery dragon of old. Planetary science is the study of all things planets. Everything that happens inside a planet, the planetary motion around this host star, even to some extent what inhabits the surface. My subdiscipline within the broader umbrella of planetary science is kind of astrophysics, so the study of planetary orbits, how do they interact with each other, how do planetary systems form and evolve. My name is Konstantin Batygin, Assistant Professor of Planetary Science at Caltech. And I'm perhaps most widely known for the Planet Nine hypothesis, the idea and the, the kind of theoretical calculations that uh, essentially prove the existence of an additional 
massive body that orbits the sun on a much more elongated and extended orbit than the typical planets of our solar system. Planet 9 is a planet about 10 times more massive than the Earth itself that resides so far from the sun. It still orbits the sun, but its orbit is so big that it takes 20,000 years to go around. We have legitimate data to really support the notion that indeed there are patterns that can only be explained by the existence of an additional planet. If you go to the outer reaches of the solar system, the most distant orbits that we know of, they all swing out into the same overall direction. And that's telling us something, that there is a gravitational pull that is acting to sort of shepherd these little bodies that we observe. The question then is, where is this gravitational pull coming from? And using relatively sophisticated mathematical models of the solar system's evolution, right, the gravitational pulls among all of these bodies, we can demonstrate that this clustering of orbits, this alignment of the distant bodies, is indicative of the existence of an additional planet in the solar system. And using their orbits, we can calculate the orbit of the planet. Planet 9 is exceptionally dim. Backyard telescopes, no matter how big, cannot spot Planet 9. It is what we call technically a magnitude 24 star, which is just astronomy talk for really, 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 really dim. So we need the largest telescopes on Earth, even to just spot some of the light that's been reflected off of its surface back onto the Earth. We may discover this hypothesized planet this fall. We're hoping to, actually. And if we find it, though, it's going to be a thousand astronomical units away. We may find it this fall, but it's not coming to, to get us or anything like that. Planet 9 is there looking for something that's also perturbing our outer planets, but it has a large orbit that's outside our present solar system. Well, that's not what I'm looking at, and that's not what's been misrecorded. We have another smaller body with a much smaller orbit, roughly 360-year orbit uh, coming in and out. That's roughly about 90 to 94 astronomical units out. We're looking at two different objects. To the best of my understanding, and really my understanding is quite basic uh, on this uh, conspiracy theory, if you will, Nibiru is supposed to be an ob a planet that's on a really eccentric orbit, um, right, that crosses the orbit of the Earth or something like that. Uh, and it's, a, long story short, it's supposed to destroy uh, all life on Earth, as I understand it. This would be a pretty bright a star in the night sky. It would be visible to your backyard telescope. Probably be visible to the naked eye. Why have more people not seen the Planet X system on a visible or astronomical basis? This object is in the infrared range and only in unusual atmospheric conditions are you going to see it. This is why so many of the professional telescopes, the Vatican owns, Mount Graham, Arizona, these are infrared telescopes. The South Pole Telescope big question is, why do we even have one down there? Why not just put another telescope in Chile? The answer is, it's the best location for visibly sighting it in the infrared range, for visibly tracking it. Will there be a warning uh, before Planet X arrives? They will probably give a 40-day warning to the public. Each country will warn its own people in their own language. Remember where it says in the Bible, it says, for a wicked and adulterous generation, there'll be only one sign, that's the sign of Jonah. I take that to mean the 40 days of warning that Jonah gave to Nineveh. This is when Planet X is just rounding the sun, and we can see it from where Earth is at the time. We have visual sighting of it then at 40 days. The model works out with that comment. That's exactly what Jonah was showing to Nineveh. 
some have suggested that the dragon could be Planet X, Nibiru, Planet Nine. I'm skeptical about that, even though I wouldn't throw out any possibilities. It's named Planet X because it won't get a name until somebody actually observes it, so it's never been observed. Today we're seeing some people look at Revelation chapter 12 when the Bible talks about 12 stars and it talks about a red dragon, those type of things. As I look at Revelation 12, and as you really just read it in its natural element, you'll see that really what the author is talking about there is he's retelling the history of Israel. Obviously, the 12 stars would refer to Joseph's dream in Genesis 37, speaking of the 12 tribes of Israel. The red dragon refers to Satan. Those things are pretty much explained in the passage itself. Uh, and I think one of the, the cautions we must have in biblical prophecy and looking at the signs is that sometimes people go out into the world, they see things that are happening or about to happen, then they retroactively apply those things to Scripture. I think that commits an error of reading things into the Bible instead of seeing the Bible for what it's actually saying and then going out in the world and saying, are those things really happening? Planet X, or Nibiru, has been read into the Scriptures. It's not literally there, and it's not physically there. People are looking for a natural reason why the events transpire in the book of the Revelation. Planet X is just the imagination of people that uh, has fallen so far um, on the ground. It, uh, there doesn't seem to be uh, any evidence of this that has been found in the real physical world. I appreciate the poetry of Nostradamus. I appreciate the people that have written about 2012 in the Mayan calendar, but this is absolutely no comparison whatsoever. This is not Hollywood anymore. This is reality. This is where astronomy and the Bible meet. Planet X is the calling card. It creates all of the anomalies, all of the atmospheric conditions, all of the asteroid impacts. It creates over 90% of the problems in the book of the apocalypse. Planet X, the destroyer, is the destroyer. If a big object crosses the Earth's orbit at a safe distance, then nothing happens. If a big object crosses the Earth's orbit at an unsafe distance, then the Earth gets ejected from the solar system, right? We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be still be orbiting the sun. The gravitational kick that we get from a body like that would be absolutely detrimental to our orbit. And as a consequence, we know that this has not happened because we're still here. It also just makes no sense from the point of view of, gee, the solar system has lasted four and a half billion years and something that plows through the solar system, every orbit would have disrupted that, right? Let, let's ignore that for a second. It's just its immediate effects would be visible. It's just not there. It isn't true that planet-changing catastrophe is part of the Book of Revelation. We do a disservice to antiquity because we don't really understand what they were saying and we allow ourselves the indulgence of imagining that they thought about these things the way we did, that they coded them into their traditions and their beliefs as if this is just carried forward. Well, I think that is an underestimation of people's imagination and in fact the solidity of their cultural traditions people who are on the move today to look for this kind of thing will seek sources that they can exploit to bolster the argument, which is ultimately, in, in their minds, just another catastrophe coming. Well, it seems to be a much more reasonable catastrophe if somebody in the past also said it. Now, for most people, it's relatively harmless entertainment, but there are folks out there who are afraid for their kids, school teachers who are wondering what to do. They don't know necessarily how to make a judgment about this, and I think the purveyors of this kind of nonsense ought to take some responsibility for the fear that they unnecessarily instill in otherwise perfectly normal and friendly people. Something that's very interesting about the year 2017 is that it seems to fulfill a number of different generational numbers in the scriptures. 
the Hebrew date of 5777 is the year 2017. That number seven is significant in scripture. All numbers in scripture have significance and symbolism. Seven is the perfect number. It's the number of God. It's the number that uh, we associate with perfection. A triple seven is just like a triple six, 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 which is the number of man, number of evil. Uh, in triad form, it reemphasizes the perfection of God. If we look at 2017 as year zero, and we look at Israel and what's been happening to Israel years ago to come back into her land, it seems to have started 120 years ago. A man named Theodore Herzl held a congress in Basel, Switzerland in 1897, in which at the end of the conference he wrote in his notes that he founded the Jewish state. If Theodore Herzl founded the Jewish state in 1897, the next step that took place was the Balfour Declaration. This happened in 1917. And then the next thing that happened was that the UN General Assembly decided to vote and they voted to create the State of Israel. That was in 1947. Then the Jews started coming back in their land. There was a war in 1948, which is called the War of Independence. They got their land and they declared themselves a state. In 1967, there was another war of which the Jews took back their capital, which they didn't have in 1947 or 48. But you've got everything landing on a seven, 1897, 1917, 1947, 1967, and a jubilee, which is a special 50 year period to the Jews from 1967 lands us in 2017, of which there are two epic signs in the heavens, which are declaring possibly the return of the Messiah. 120 years, 100 years, 70 years, 50 years. And year zero then could only be, counting this way, 2017 would be the beginning of the apocalypse. But what happens on September 23rd, 2017? We can only speculate and we have to be careful. Personally, I found that I cannot find anything better that would paint the picture that we read in Revelation 12. September 23rd, okay, what's gonna happen? Probably the same stuff as September 22nd and September 24th, daily current events. Now I can't say nothing big will happen. I mean, it's possible that Trump will do something and. North Korean dictator will do something, you know, of course, but these things could happen any day. I personally don't get all bent around the axle on dates and times and this, that, and the other thing. Even though I look at things and I analyze them and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, this could happen now, this could happen then, uh, I'm prepared for the long haul. And so if nothing happens, good. <laughs> you know, that, that's more time where I can plant my garden and, and play with my grandkids and things like that. If something happens, good. We're getting this party started. We tend to assign a lot of meanings to the motion of stars as they appear on our night sky. It's the wrong thing to do. If we were to view whatever alignment that we see on our night sky, from, say from Mars, on exactly the same day, it'd be totally different. It wouldn't be there. Things that are kind of moving around in a complicated way might appear as if they're lining up, but in reality they're just going about their regular trek. If nothing took place, I, I just don't see that happening. I can't see that happening. I believe it's mathematically impossible. I, I don't believe in coincidence. The beginning of the end is 2017. The beginning of the end is on and after September 23rd, 2017. The end time messianic age is upon us. The confirmation of the covenant, watch, this fall, will be the day of trumpets. It was a privilege to serve you, 
and it will be an honor to die by your side in the service of the King of Kings. I have daughters and I have grandchildren, and before going, I'm going to make sure that they understand that this is something that I feel that I need to do, and I'm going to be leaving them instructions on what to do should this all take place. Most people in the world, they don't want to see it happen. And most people are going to keep their eyes closed and pretend nothing is going to happen. And when it does, they too will be in a little bit of shock. These things were prophesied 2,000 years ago. They're coming to pass now, and now they're seeing it happen. So hopefully I put it in context for them so that they will know what to do. I think we miss the fact of signs. I think when we look at a sign, we have somebody who wants to write a book and say, this is what's going to happen on that because this sign happened. I think the message of the sign is really kind of to alert us. Again, as Jesus taught in parables, he hid truths there. Can we just pass it off and say it means nothing? I think even a skeptic cannot pass it off and say it means nothing. I'm not so sure I'm interested in what specifically is going to happen. What's gonna happen is going to happen. God has his time frame and he knows what he's going to do. What I'm more interested in is seeing America, seeing people wake up and seeing people say, hey, let me throw off any of my preconceived notions. Let me look at the science behind this and the spiritual aspect of this and see if I'm personally ready for whatever's going to happen. Could this be the year? This could be the year.